this is wonderful. It's always wonderful to be back at Stanford, so many familiar faces, and I'm, I'm honored to be a speaker here today. Uh, uh, as a history of this seminar, I was uh, involved when the seminar was started initially uh, with, uh, with Marco uh, when we, we started this in AA. Uh, for those of you who joined us and for those of you who might be joining us online, I am Animesh Garg. I am currently at NVIDIA uh, and I split my time with University of Toronto and I'll soon be at Georgia Tech. I always like to start my talk with this particular video uh, that I've actually kept constant for five plus years. Uh, this really is a reminder for me uh, that this is such an exciting problem to be working on, yet it is so hard that progress actually is far slower than you might believe it is. Uh, so the problem statement of a lot of my research is very simple. We want to build robots that can help you in a general set of tasks, ideally something like what Rosie from the Jetsons in 1960s could do. And, and without doubt, you want these systems to do a variety of things from cleaning, cooking, laundry, and so on and so forth. And all of this really should work in, well, not just the lab or demos, but homes uh, or places where we really want it to work. So that brings me to what we really study or, or algorithmically. The core of our current agenda is understanding both reasoning and control for embodied systems, particularly in the purview of robot manipulation. And I believe this is a two-stage process. First stage of this process is somehow figuring out what is the task. Uh, how is the task specified? It can be specified in many ways. We need to be able to achieve the task in constraint settings. And then we need yet another set of algorithms to figure out how to generalize from that specification uh, to a broad range of settings. I use a chair as an example. You can, you can give a demo of how to build a chair, but we really need to understand the concept of building a chair. And today I, I, I decided to do a talk, as Mark said, slightly differently in the sense instead of giving you a very detailed overview of a few papers, which you can actually go and read by yourselves many times, I tried to give you an overview of my research, trying to give you the thread that connects them and the questions that we can answer, which is often not visible in a single paper ever. So let's try to solve this problem, right? You can try to solve these problems in two ways. One is what I would like to call like a more conventional uh, robotics manner, where you can build these structured pipelines where you can have planning, perception, and control. And often these things are what I would call one problem, one solution. There's nothing wrong in it, by the way. It's just that uh, the nature of the solution forces it to be structured. The other end of the spectrum can be, let's say, motivated or inspired by machine learning techniques where you can just add data. Uh, and the hope is that the data is effective enough in some amount of large quantities that we will figure out an end-to-end -end system that would achieve these tasks. I would argue neither of these systems are perfect. Uh, on one end, you need experts. This is limited applicability. There are trade-offs between perform performance and flexibility. On the other aspect, well, the main problem is computational sustainability. <laughs> these days, many data sets are so large that we don't actually have access to those models. Uh, the data itself may not be accessible to people. Uh, and even then, you have out of distribution errors. So it's not clear this is the right approach. If you go back in the history of machine learning, before it was machine learning, or before it was deep learning, to psychology, and before that, to philosophy, this has been a consistent theme uh, across researchers over, I would even say, centuries, not even decades, where you need what they call an inductive bias to make the inductive leap necessary for the generalization we need. I will describe what, the, what this means is. What they are basically saying is, there is no generalization without structure. Now you might ask, what is structure? Well, structure appears in many ways. Structure can be domain knowledge, inductive bias in the sense you have models of particular kinds, symmetries, priors, models. And then data itself is also, well, it comes in different varieties. It's online, offline, simulated, real, labeled, self-supervised, human, or, or automated. 
And if you look at, let's say, the success of modern machine learning, one could argue that the three pillars of modern machine learning are structured models, large data sets, and large compute. In fact, this formula has been fairly successful, pretty much sort of like it keeps on going and we don't know when it will stop right now. Uh, both in language and in vision, uh, you add data, you train larger models, larger data sets, seems to work. Now the problem is robots appear to be slightly different or ever so slightly, right? Robots break many of these assumptions. We don't have large data sets. Uh, the data sets are minuscule. The models are not yet structured, and compute is not required, or at least not as much. Uh, we can very easily break a lot of assumptions due to the fact that this system is embodied. Now, all of these, whether it's vision language or robotics, are in a sense problems in study of intelligence. One would argue, rather controversially, that uh, the problem of intelligence is built on movement. Movement is the need that results in intelligence. In fact, some neuroscientists argue that when you stop movement, you eat your own brain. Uh, so you don't need to be intelligent. There are actual uh, organisms which do that. Uh, so then uh, there is an argument that movement is the primary notion of why you need sensory, cognitive, planning, uh, and all sorts of intelligence uh, that let's say people in vision and language study about. In fact, there is one more argument. Intelligence is not this general purpose thing that we think of it as. Uh, there is no notion that you can solve everything with one set of models. Every agent, let's say humans, have a set of problems that we are built for. And our hardware and learning mechanisms are adapted to it. It's just that that set of problems is fairly broad, which is why it is interesting. So there is evidence from, uh, again, neuroscience, which says that humans are hyper-specialized even in hardware. Human adult brains have special regions for identifying faces and identifying scenes more than any generic perception. And this is something that has been confirmed that this exists even in very young babies. This is not something that you develop over time. This is actually hardwired. So you have structure. Structure for the problems you are expected to solve. And the same happens in learned specialization. So this was a very fascinating study. Humans, especially adults, can identify individuals often of their own species sometimes of their own race even. Uh, that is why there was this argument that it's much harder for people to identify individuals across races. But babies are very good at it, to a point that babies can identify individuals of other species. Babies can identify monkeys. But that, that ability that exists in about two-month-old babies goes away by the, by the time they're nine-month-old, which is remarkable. Because what it tells us is the ability to tell monkeys apart is not a skill that you need very often, so it goes away soon. The hardware supports it. It's just that the software does away with it because the distribution of tasks you need to do does not require that. This brings us back to why we should be studying structure. There is always going to be a set of things you want your agents to do. And that set of things will dictate what sort of structure you should have in your system, what sort of data, uh, or what sort of implicit biases your data will bring. So broadly, I study three things. What sort of structure representation should we be thinking about in robotics? How can we discover this structure purely from data? And then, because we are, well, indeed roboticists, how would we deploy this on practical systems so that we can build increasingly complex systems that are of, well, practical use? For today's talk, we will focus on one of these things, which is structure. What sort of structured inductive biases should we think about for robotics? In particular, we will try to give you an overview of structure in three particular questions. What sort of object level representations should you look at? How will they come about? Is there structure in the process of decision-making itself? 
And then finally, can we do something by learning from others uh, in this process? Can we do something better uh, through the data itself? So let's get started. Let's look at object-oriented perception. And, and let's get started with a problem that I think many of you would be familiar with, something like assembly, putting things together. It is not necessarily assembling cars and, and complex things. I am thinking simple assembly like putting a cap on a pen. Right? And, and these sort of problems appear so very often that it feels that this, there should be some sort of geometric primitive in this. Like we should have some underlying mechanism to do this. This appears basically, you can really think of this problem as what we call shape mating. You are given two shapes, you should understand how they go together, if they go together. Again, this problem would appear in not just assembly, but like problems in well, broken vases, broken sculptures, fossils, maybe medicine, br broken bones. So we started by thinking like, how can we even study this problem? So we started with the shape data set. We tried to be fancy, we took the data set and we break it apart, like we literally break objects. And then, we also make the problem harder by making some of these objects hollow, so that the interface where they connect is not, let's say, a full surface. It's just uh, edges and ribs. So now, essentially, the problem is you have these uh, point clouds inputs, and you want to figure out how would they connect if they would connect. So very simply, this is a registration problem. You can start with two point clouds. You want to predict the rotation and translation of these two point clouds such that they can register together into some shape. It is important to note, because we are breaking objects, these are not parts. There is no semantic about any of these parts. You are essentially fracturing things, right? So if you do something that is very common in computer vision, which is basically point cloud registration, this happens. What this happens is basically if you are registering two point clouds that are similar, let's say a bunny to a bunny, the usual Stanford bunny example, it works. But if you are trying to register things which are actually mating together, then the registration surface is very small. Uh, and that is why these sort of model-based methods result in very high error. So we resort to a learning-based method where you now have to predict essentially pose estimation laws. This is where structure comes in. It turns out that if you just force this pose estimation loss, you cannot actually solve this problem. You need to have a prior of what the world of human shapes look like. So we put in an adversarial loss that if I put a pen cap with a pen, the thing should look like a pen, or thing should look like an object. In fact, we also put in one more prior where if I see half of the object, I should be able to impute what the other half would look like, or what the missing half would look like which gives me a strong prior on human object shapes. And this is particularly baking in the structure in the model architecture training itself. Eventually, you will only use the top half of the model. You don't need any of the adversarial losses and shape completion models. These are only what you would call regularizers to make sure that the model can indeed learn the right thing. And this, this actually helped to a point where we got 100x improvement. It was surprising, uh, actually. Uh, it doesn't solve the problem, it's just that the errors here are so large that this looks minuscule by, by, by comparison. But that's still, let's say, 50 units. Uh, and this is a unitless number, 50 units for, let's say, a, an object of size 100. Right? So it's not perfect. But qualitatively, these results look much better than both, uh, let's say, other methods of doing learning-based assembly, which are not using structured priors of completing objects so that objects look complete. So that was the actually very promising because I thought this is su such a cool thing to work on. So, so we did fracturing in two objects. We said, why stop at two? Uh, uh, we can break them in arbitrary number of objects, uh, right? Uh, so we went back to large data sets and we just published a paper at NeurIPS this year uh, where now we can essentially algorithmically break objects based on stresses in, in arbitrary number of parts, and you have to define how many parts you want, and it will break them up, sometimes in chips. If you, want to, if you want to shatter this statue, you can shatter it in 100 parts if you want. Uh, and then you can construct a data set where you can take an arbitrary object and you say, I want the shattered version of this screw in three parts. Now assemble this. Notice this is a geometric assembly task. The problem still is very similar, but this time around, uh, it turns out that because you have much smaller parts, the current models we have are not very good at imagining what 
the full part of the object would be. If I give you just a chip of the head, it's not clear what the body would look like. Uh, and, and that makes this problem very hard. In fact, we tried all of our methods. Uh, our own method didn't work very well because this regularization works for large parts, not very small parts. This is why we actually decided to put it in benchmarks. This is an open invitation for people. We believe this is a problem that we should be solving. Our current methods are not doing very well, but this is a problem uh, that is very important according to me. Uh, this has applications not just in robotics where you're trying to build objects, but think archeology, span where you, you only discover parts of things. You never discover a full dinosaur, uh, uh, or, or in graphics, of course. So, so independent of this, this, I believe, is a core ability that somehow we are born with, the ability to complete things, uh, when even the parts have no semantic meaning. So this is like, let's say, lesson number one, that we need core, or what you would call fundamental models of these abilities like geometric mating, so that we can go from there to doing structured tasks like assembly when you're given parts and you can do this. Okay, let's look at a different problem. This time around, you are given objects and you want to use objects. So let's say you are a hammer and the task uh, is to sweep the object, you're not allowed to touch the water bottle. That's a constraint. And then in the other case, you actually have to apply some sort of impulse uh, to do the hammer, which is the usual thing. Now you can take an unknown object where you don't know the shape, or an unknown instance, and the obvious use case can be, okay, optimize for grasp, and then, and then we will figure out what task we should do. It turns out that that was not a very good idea, because optimal grasp may not result in, well, anything, because if you grasp the hammer by the center of mass, it's actually completely useless as a hammer. Uh, so, so you have to figure out what is the functional affordance which may not be optimal for a stage of the task. In fact, you grab them uh, independently. So, so this is a project that we worked on uh, a few years ago where you can predict many grasps, you can rank these grasps based on the current task you are interested in, and you can then pick the grasp and actually try to do simulation or actually try it out in the real world. Uh, whether it will work, and that gives you the signal for learning multiple tasks. This again is a prior of what I would call functional affordance rather than labeled affordance. A human is not telling a robot that grab the hammer here because the human has five fingers while the robot has two. So how it needs to grab a hammer may look very different. Actually, we found in this case, hammering like this is much more stable than, than actually trying to do this because then the, row, the hammer doesn't slip out of a parallel geography. So this is, again, yet important thing to understand here. The lesson here is affordance is a property not just of the environment, but property of an environment with the agent. Morphology matters. So I think we were able to show good results. No surprise, of course. Uh, we were able to show better results than baselines, and I'll, I'll skip the time to keep you to give you like the big picture idea. The interesting thing was that the fact that we were learning these functional affordances purely from data allowed us to generalize better to new objects. And because we used a particular architecture where we were only using point clouds uh, at the time, we could also generalize to a real robot, and we could try the same tasks with real robots without knowing object models for these individual uh, parts. And again, uh, that we were able to do multiple tasks, in this case, both sweeping and, uh, and hammering. Uh, so so that's a that's good story, right? So now, now what we have covered. I talked about, first of all, having geometric primitives of objects. Then we talked about this idea of, can we use objects? Now let's go one more level up. Okay, there is a world with multiple objects. Can I do some sort of reasoning? Let's look at a very simple problem first. Let's say the world is very simple. It is marked with some tiles. You need to move that Coke can to this yellow square. The constraint is that the Coke can never leaves the marked gray tiles. So it never goes on wood. Right? The solution is rather simple, actually. Uh, any motion planner should be able to do this. This is super simple. Now you add other objects, and suddenly the problem becomes difficult for motion planners, because now you have to do discrete decision making. Can you push the Coke can directly through it? Uh, are you going to push this other object along with it? 
Should you make a discrete decision of pushing this other object out of the way first? Uh, and that idea of making discrete and continuous decision makes this problem suddenly very hard. And notice this is super simple toy example. The world is much more complicated than 3D. But this, this happens all the time. Think of like loading and unloading a dishwasher. You need to unload clean stuff before you load dirty stuff. Right? So you are doing discrete and continuous reasoning simultaneously. It's not clear how we should do this. Right? So in this case, the answer was yes, you should uh, push it out and then you can do this. So what we did was we said maybe we can learn models of dynamics that allow us to do this simultaneous discrete and continuous reasoning at the same time. So that I don't have to separate this reasoning problem from the motion planning problem completely independently. In this case, what we can do is we can basically learn a model, and I'm, I'm, I'm not going into the details as I said, but the main takeaway is it's a hierarchical latent variable model where the latent variables can be thought of as high level abstract actions which allow you to do discrete reasoning. If I push this, this will be out of the way. I don't need to worry about what exact position where it will be. Uh, so then you can basically do look ahead based planning where think of each of these things as discrete trees while a single tree can have uncertainty and, and continuity. And this allows us to again go to a real robot and the problem we, we show here is very similar that you have to put the yellow box in the yellow block and there are multiple objects in the way but in this case, we are not doing, and I want to impress upon this, explicit task planning. There is, this is an end-to-end -end controller. Uh, so the ability to do discrete planning or decision making is important because earlier this was done with explicit search. We are using an object-oriented model here. Okay, so, so we, we showed you that you can use objects, you can build these models if you can detect objects because you have to understand the objects exist. Let's look at a more fundamental problem in vision. What are objects? Uh, if you look at a scene, should you segment everything ahead of time and then decide what objects you want to use? Let's answer a simple question. If you are an autonomous car, does it matter that the cafe on the side of the walk has a handle or not. For an autonomous car, I would argue it doesn't matter. Why would a car have a representation for a handle? There is no action space that allows it to interact. Right? So even representation of things that you see are actually built on things that you can do. If you cannot do anything about it, you actually don't even observe those things. How do we build such models that can do ground-up perception that is task aware? So in first case, we said, let's try to build causal models. Causal models would allow us to build uh, representations of the world that is minimal by design. So let's play this game. I tell you the answer for this one. It is basically guess the dynamics. Right? So one ball bouncing in a box. Uh, try this one. It's actually not the trick question. It's just multiple balls bouncing in the box. How about this one? Notice that the balls change direction without collision sometimes. Yeah. Right? This is important. We need to build models where there are underlying connections. Think of it like this, that when people guessed the fact that there is gravity, they don't actually see gravity. They build models of it by observing motions. So in this case, the model is actually that one where I have put random springs and rods and strings, but you don't see them, you only see the balls moving around. Now you might say, oh, but I can get enough data and I'll, I'll just like memorize this with a neural network. Well, what if I just change that, that adjacency matrix? I can have an arbitrary adjacency matrix. I can have an arbitrary spring. So you need to be able to learn to do this with very little data. That's where causality comes in. We cannot memorize we need to be able to generalize this. And if you still don't trust me, well then there are objects which don't have very simple discrete nature. There is a shirt that you need to fold. Uh, I don't want to simulate the whole thing. I want to look at only, let's say, a reduced order model. 
if you think you have seen enough shirts, uh, then maybe what about pants or pantsuits? And if you still don't trust me, what about women's tops? Uh, they are asymmetric, and I don't even know how they are stored, actually, to be practical. Uh, if at all they are ever folded. <laughs> so jokes aside, what we did was we started with visual observations, and we built this model uh, where we can start with object-oriented models. So we can define objects with key points, a sufficient number of key points to define the object. This is learned in an unsupervised setting. Then you can use this key point model to think of this as a graph where you need to define edges. And you need to learn edges, which edges exist, and what parameters do those edges have. And then you can use this graph to actually predict dynamics. The important thing to note is, along this process, the only loss you get is actually prediction of dynamics, nothing else. Because there is no ground truth for what the key points are. There is no ground truth for what the edges are. Uh, so we are only doing prediction losses. And this allows us to actually model fairly generic things, right? We started with the ball example, but now you can actually apply the same model where ground truth is not even clear. For example, what is a 10 point reduced model for, let's say a towel, uh, or, or a shirt for that matter, right? And you can build fairly general purpose dynamics models with, with these kind of systems with the same representation. The key is that I'm not training separate models for separate data sets. It's the same representation trained on all of these data sets simultaneously. So you're basically, again, building an object-oriented representation that is sufficient or minimal for you. It is not doing the whole thing. Maybe if the task was to actually model the whole finite element, the number of key points required would be much larger. Right? Okay. So the takeaway was you can do interesting causal dynamics if the representation is object-oriented key points. Okay. Let's make the problem slightly more interesting. So people have attempted this idea, actually, this idea of key point based dynamics uh, uh, over a variety of these problems. So this is, I think, uh, uh, work from Bataglia et al, where they looked at interaction based dynamics. If you are in a multi-body system, how do you know what objects matter even to begin with? Right? What, what is foreground and background? Uh, is the things that move, they are foreground? Or everything that is a separate texture that is foreground? How do you define that? So we started with uh, even more sort of like structured model where we, which is called slots, not our invention. The whole idea is you, instead of defining the notion of objects, you define what is called a slot. Think of a slot as a container for information, right? And we basically argue that different slots should have different information that compose the scene. So I'm, con I'm basically taking a continuous representation of the world and converting it into discretized abstractions, which will help me do reasoning in the future, which is very useful, actually, as a tool. And then, oops, I can basically just do this frame by frame where I can learn different, so I can learn that this red object is actually a separate entity than this purple object. I don't want to call it an object. I could basically, so these containers can contain what, whatever information you want, right? This is background, this is purple object, this is blue object. I could have chosen to use containers for shape and color separately. Uh, but this is, again, not specified by human, but only reconstruction loss. Now the question that we were studying was, can we use this idea to actually build dynamics models so that we can do general purpose tasks, more than one tasks. So that is what we, we end up doing. We start with uh, images and we built a slot encoder to learn these object containers or slots. Now you can take these slots as ordered sets, essentially, and you don't need to worry about what goes in what slot or what is the actual ordering. We basically learn an attention-based model, which is a transformer. Many of you may be aware. Uh, uh, we are not going to get into details of it, so don't worry about it if you don't know. You're basically building an attention over these tokens, if you will, to predict the next token. What would be the next token with certain properties? In this case, you can really think that this object has four tokens because there are four objects. Uh, and then we are interested in, let's say, some properties of these tokens as they evolve over time. 
And then you can build an autoregressive model, essentially, to predict future. And because this is, an, uh, this is an encoder decoder model, you can take the predicted tokens, predict the image out of it, reconstruct the image, and use essentially videos for supervision. So the whole process is what you would call self-supervised. You only need a video to train this model. No labels explicitly are required. So it's completely unsupervised. Uh, in that sense, it's actually nice because I can now take in data without human intervention. So we first started looking at, okay, let's try to take this problem and see if we are actually able to do a good job of doing dynamics prediction. That was the pr problem to begin with. Uh, and we found that there are a variety of ways to do prediction in, even within, let's say, the deep learning era where you can use RNN-based models. This is a simple RNN on top of slots. Uh, I think SWM and VQ former uh, I think I'm missing on the details. And then the hours is our slot former model. The important thing here is we are now able to build a model that keeps visual sharpness as it predicts. Uh, because you're predicting only tokens, reconstruction is always sharp. But it also maintains semantic consistency. So for example, if you notice, when objects move, they don't disappear. Because, again, the information about every object is in a slot, so you can keep consistency. So this essentially allows us to actually do very interesting stuff. Now I can do predictions, so I can ask questions about this world. So we take this one, one step forward. We did not intend for this model to solve this problem. It just so happens that because we can build good dynamics models, we can ask questions like, the cube and the blue sphere, will they collide? In the, in the question. So in doing so, you have to build a model that will actually anticipate uh, few collisions in the future. Right? And again, if you show a few observed states and then make the model predict the future, we found that our unsupervised model, which is in pink here, is actually matching or beating models which use explicit information about what objects are and where are they in the scene, which is remarkable because Again, we are not building our model to solve this task. Uh, qualitatively, as I said, if you notice, in both of these examples, you are predicting through two collisions. This green object collides with the red object first, then reflex collides with the uh, magenta object, and only then can you answer this question. Uh, and, and in this case, I do want to mention, this is not magic, it is a deterministic model, so we are not capturing the stochasticity of physics. That's something that we could look into. We have not so far. We said, why stop there? Can we actually do decision making with this model now on more interesting, complex, what people call, uh, let's say, puzzle style games? So the game is very simple here. You are allowed to put this red block anywhere in the scene, and then physics rolls forward. And then the objective is such that given the construction of the scene, this object, the green object, should touch the blue object, always. Uh, and then this, this is one of those sort of like iPad or, or these mobile games where the construction of the scene can be arbitrary. Some objects are stationary, the gray objects, uh, some objects move. And now you actually have to build a model that will actually do reasonably good dynamics, but because it's not just balls this, this time around, because there are objects with properties and stuff. And we found that it, our model was surprisingly successful. First of all, we were able to learn very meaningful slots. For example, all the slats were separate objects. The ball in the cup is one object because they never separate, at least in this particular environment. If they were to separate, they would become separate objects. And then you can roll this out. And using just a rollout model, you can do look-ahead-based planning. I can basically do batch decisions over thousands of possible decisions and then come up with this model. And we, could, we were able to get actually about 80-85% 80, success rate in this game completely unsupervised. So yet again, the takeaway here is unsupervised but structured models. In this case, the structure is object slots, which allow us to do prediction. Can build general purpose systems, which allow us to do multiple tasks. OK. So we, we looked at perception so far. Now let's talk about decision making. I believe I have about 15 minutes. A lot of the recent work in vision, 
language has been built on successes of carefully crafted architectures. We did not start with very simple sort of connections and just throw data at them. Uh, we started with CNNs, which captured locality. These days, a lot of the success uh, in many of the domains is actually due to the fact that we can use attention, whether it's cross-attention or self-attention in transformers that we can use. There are particular kinds of loss structures that we use, uh, and, and there are particular kind of, let's say, contrastive methods that we use. Let's look at a, a problem of robot decision making. Many of you may already be aware of the standard Markov decision process. I will not belabor that. For a case of robotics, you can really think of it like this, that there is an observation, there is some sort of agent, the agent is learned or not, it doesn't really matter. The agent has some sort of update rule uh, that it uses, and as it interacts with the environment, the environment provides it a next state and reward. That's sufficient to understand. This particular mechanism has indeed fairly gone far. We have been able to do many interesting tasks, some from vision without knowing structure. But often, if you notice, they are very what you would call specialized tasks. I, I have this domain. I will train on this domain. I'll be able to solve this domain. At this point, in fact, one could even argue with sufficient amount of engineering, you can automate any task. But well, we were able to do that already, weren't we? Uh, uh, so, uh, so what the question is, how do we do learning fast. Uh, uh, babies are born, or in, in general, organisms are born without full control of their body. In this case, I really like the elephant clip, where the elephant baby is born without having any control over the, the trunk. But it learns to use the trunk fairly effectively very quickly. And then on the bottom is a baby playing in an open-ended environment, and it basically just explores uh, a task space where there is no well, reward function, if you will. So then the question really we are asking is, what sort of model bias or structured bias do we have in this learning system that is enabling this general generality? To do this, I think we have to dive deeper. We have to dive deeper of like what this decision making looks like. We have an observation that is processed, first of all, into some state. This can be your perception system. When you think of an agent, we have to look deeper what are the things that are inside an agent. The obvious thing is there is some sort of reactive policy, but there are a few other things. A transition model, maybe the, maybe the agent is thinking about what needs to be, it needs to predict. Maybe it has a value function which allows us to do long-term decision making. And depending on uh, how you use these things, it's either planning or learning, and you have some sort of update rule. And finally, even the action you output actually is transformed into some control uh, uh, in some manner. And the questions here are, where are the insights here? One way to solve this M MDP problem is called off-policy reinforcement learning. In that setting, you basically interact with the environment, collect data, use, using that fixed data set, you estimate a value function. I'm not going to define how we do all of that detail, but then given a value function, you can back out a policy by doing some greedy uh, search on the policy. And then now you go back and collect a bit more data and you do this. It's called off-policy because the data that is being collected and then the Q function that you're learning are not necessarily from the same policy. That's the only thing. So where is information here? First simple question is, if we are asking to do deep learning, uh, does the choice of architecture matter? Well, why wouldn't it? It has mattered in vision and, and, and language. We did some simple testing. Instead of using MLPs, which is the default currently, if you use ResNets, which is basically giving hierarchical information, we found even with such a simple trick, we were able to improve performance across the board on all tasks, uh, on, on, on all tasks, on multiple libraries, uh, to a point where we didn't believe that this could be a paper. <laughs> we never wrote a paper about this. We actually wrote like a two-pager and submitted this to a workshop because we thought that who would believe this is a paper? Uh, uh, then the question is, we have always been very fascinated with this idea of value function. But when we think of this value function, we are, what are we solving? We are basically saying, what is the value of taking one action in current state uh, if I follow this policy to the end of time? Uh, let's answer a simple question. If I give you a take home exam and it has hard questions, it doesn't really matter what order you do them in. But if I give you the same exam, but you have 30 minutes to do it, does the order matter? 
probably you will do easy questions first. Best bang for buck, why not? We are not doing that because we are solving the same RL problem for the end of time. Time matters. So we actually changed that. We showed that if you do value function, which is what we call horizon aware, then you are basically giving the policy an ability to capture different solution modes in the same policy. And this somehow makes the whole process, again, more efficient. Going back to our diagram of RL, I'm going to now show you that there's so much structure to be left on the table. Let's look at transition models. I already showed you that you can learn structured transition models with latent variable models, and you can do planning with them. Cool. When we learn transition models, or when we do model-based RL, or any sort of model-based system, often what we do is we collect some data, we fit a predictive model, and the only argument is prediction is a sufficient objective for decision making. Again, I, ask, I like asking questions. Uh, can you predict what is the airflow here? Or if you have collected sufficient data, in principle you can. Should you? Likely no. Why? Well, it doesn't matter to the kind of task you need to do. There's almost no task that requires you to think about airflow next to my hand. So why are we forcing models to learn things that are existent in the data? So we found exactly that, that objectives in model learning should be task aware. And this appears explicitly when model capacity is constrained. Currently, we have been looking at simple problems and throwing a bazooka of compute, so we never really encountered the problem. If you really constrain the model, you start to see this problem. If I have two-dimensional system and I add 100 dimensions of, let's say, random obstacle states, the model will really get confused. Uh, but you can figure out that only two of them matter. Uh, so this is one example that objective, even, even simple things that we take for granted are not really actually simple. Similarly, let's look at prediction uh, for perception. So we have shown in the past that state representations matter a lot. In this particular case, the task was fairly simple. You need to do peg insertion. But this time around, we learned the representation of the peg jointly from tactile information and vision directly on the real robot. No, no simulation involved in about three hours of data. This was joint work with Jeanette uh, and Michelle and Yuka here at Stanford while I was here. But we found, once you learn these representations, RL becomes super easy. Learning policies is actually much easier if you have the right representations. If I flip the question, what about control? Uh, well, same problem. We found that there are better representations of output space because essentially, if you can do optimization in some nicer space, then why wouldn't you? A very good example was Manipulation. When you are doing manipulation, we found that end effector control with forces was very good. So we basically came up with, a, again, a very simple idea in hindsight. You control the impedance of contact uh, in the controller, and you operate in that space. That is your policy space. Policy controls that. And then you can basically go train and sim with vision, go to real without, well, the magic of domain randomization. So it was very interesting. I think it was extended by Chizaya, uh, where they learned, learned operational space control. But the idea remains the same. And the fact that this was general, it actually works on other morphologies. So we did the same trick where now we are learning only in centroidal space of, uh, of a quadruped. And then once the policy learns the uh, quadruped motion, we can basically just apply or wrap it in MPC to come up with the legs, and again, transfer works. So if there's like one thing that you take away from here, please let it be this, that when you do decision-making algorithms, do not take the algorithm for face value. It's not necessary for, use to, for you to use any of the things I talked about. But hopefully the lesson is, there's a lot of value that is on, there, on the table. Uh, do not leave it on the table. Uh, it is existent in all aspects of machine learning, uh, models, so it's not just take machine learning and apply to robotics. There's a lot of interesting stuff we, can, we need to do there. So far, I talked about simple skills. These are just single skills like grasping, picking. The kind of things we really want to do require much more effort. Uh, 
we need to do complex things that may not be discovered. You don't discover by accident how to make pasta. You actually learn to make pasta by watching people. Uh, there's not enough eggs in the world uh, uh, to make a good omelet by discovery. Uh, uh, in fact, there, it has been shown that people actually learn from imitation. It is important for our cultural transmission of knowledge. Uh, without imitation, it just wouldn't work. Uh, people have argued, in fact, half of YouTube is just how-to videos. Uh, and so is TikTok. I think the world is moving fast. Uh, uh, so, so we need to be able to learn uh, in this kind of setup. From, well, imitation. So one of the first projects we worked on was, well, can we collect data for robotics? We have about five minutes, and I'll give you the key crux of it. We collected a bunch of data. We, we spent a lot of time collecting data, actually. And I'm not telling you a success story. I'm telling you a failure, of something that we learned a lot from. Me, Ajay, and a bunch of people here collected a lot of data. We are very proud of the infrastructure we built. It allowed us to collect data from, from a bunch of places. We were able to collect a lot of data. Uh, and we showed that we can learn purely from fixed data a reasonable amount of policy. You can even do learning from vision. And again, this work was extended. I think that number that I had at 40 is now, I believe, 70 or 80. But it is, it is good that you can get to 80% out of the box. But it was really leaving a lot on the table. What was it leaving on the table? If I want to do a task, let's say a mom is teaching a baby how to sweep. This is what we were doing right now. We had a lot of data of moms showing sweeping and our robot attempting to do sweeping. Most of the times, no sweeping was happening. Uh, uh, the robot basically is just swaying things that look meaningful. What you really need is the ability to understand what is happening in the task and then actually plan for it. And ideally, what I call understand the notion of what is the purpose of the task and come up with different plans for it. And this, I think, is the most exciting part of the talk. What we really need is what I would call causal generative models. If you see an object or a scene and you say, open the door, you need to understand not how to open the door, but what does the concept of opening a door means. You need to be able to predict what an open door would look like. And this is like what I would call the ability to apply abstract actions in the world. We have this internal model, and this is what we can call knowledge. And again, I don't claim this idea at all, actually. If you look at cognitive and developmental neuroscience literature, it seems that they've solved all of robotic problems. We just need to look carefully. They explicitly say, the what and the how are actually separable. Uh, the what is what we actually build as priors. The how is you solve online. And we can do exactly the same. I can figure out what the notion of abstract actions in, in my imagination. And then, given that the fact that I know what an open dishwasher looks like, I can complete the task with online planning. And I'm going to show you that we can actually do just that. So, you remember that we were using slot attention for building dynamics models? I can do even fancier dynamics models. I'll, I'll skip through this slide in the interest of time for details. We can now build a dynamics model with a fixed data set, both in simulated and real settings, where I can give it information about like, take jug, open fridge, put jug in fridge. So and I can basically predict this system with a single first frame, figuring out like if I take jug and open fridge, the fridge needs to be actually open and jug needs to be in the fridge. But because this is a model that I've learned, I can do counterfactual. I can start with things that are not in the data. I can take kettle instead, open oven instead. And the same thing I can do uh, for a real robot data set as well. Again, because I'm using slots idea, the whole system is semantically consistent. When I move objects, mass transfer happens. And, and just in the context, this work was done last year. The world of image prediction is moving so fast, it's really hard to keep up. This came up like two, two days ago, I believe, or at least I came across it yesterday. So I added this slide last night. The point is, it's not that how we ended up doing it is what you should do. The point is that you need conditional generative models to do this thing. Once you have this model, you can now 
take this as a goal specification and attempt this task. For example, if I want to open a dishwasher, I need to understand an object-centric understanding of what opening a dishwasher means. Once I have that, all I need to do is an agent-centric planner. It's a goal condition planner. You can do optimal control, you can do RL, favorite tool of your choice, doesn't really matter. In this case, we actually do optimal control. Every sensing here is on board. There is no magic sensing. We do not know any of the 3D models of this thing. All we provide is the information of where to grasp. Because in this pipeline, we did not learn to grasp. But the fact that we are predicting that opened dishwasher looks like this, that's all you need. The ability to separate the what and how really makes all the difference. Learning is required on the what part much more than the how part. This is not a learned behavior, yet it is reactive. It is full whole body control, classical robotics all the way. <laughs> what the argument is, <coughs> lot of learning needs to happen on the what part, and that is where large-scale pre-trained models or foundation models, as Stanford calls it, would be very useful. So we talked about this. This is the last slide I want to say. There are multiple things we talked about, but I hope that one thing that I have impressed upon is there is no concept of generalization without structure. The structure in robotics or embodied decision-making is probably markedly different from what we are using in vision and language. So A plus B is probably not going to work. It will give you immediate gains and a lot of dopamine hits, uh, but you will probably need in the long term thinking about what sort of structure we need for decision making. And we need to figure out this idea of learning functional structure from data. We cannot basically keep the data-driven part out of this. With that, I do want to take a step back and say there are a lot of things that our, that our group does, including, including discovery and causality uh, and safety. A lot of the work that I talked about today, as Mark did mention, I've been very fortunate to collaborate with many talented, far more talented individuals than I am at different institutions. Uh, a lot of this work was completely due to them. I just uh, take credit for making the talk. Uh, uh, and thank you all for being such a patient and wonderful audience. And thank you again for inviting me. Happy to take questions. You know there's a time schedule. We are three minutes past. <laughs> well, we'll take one or two here, and then I think we'll go into the patio for more questions. Yeah, really great presentation. Uh, my question is about future prediction for dynamics models that are more complicated, maybe with more stochastic kind of dynamics. How do you envision the right representation to make sure that you can have the right kind of prediction at the right level? Like, for instance, when you drop a bottle, you don't want to predict every single piece, but still get the right idea that it's broken. Yes. I think it's much more about the representation than the dynamics. The fact that the bottle is broken or not is a semantic variable, not, uh, not let's say, usually, let's say, a state variable of the bottle. You have to add it on as a property, and then you keep track of it through some characteristics. What set of uh, semantic variables do we need to keep? probably depends on what tasks you need to solve. So this goes back again, uh, that you need to define a distribution of tasks that would allow you to choose the right representation. And then we can figure out what dynamics models to build. I believe we have a lot of technology to build the dynamics fairly well, but the representation problem is completely open. <laughs>